Tonight on Primetime Politics, the strike is over. This is excellent news for employees and for Canadians. The Public Service Alliance reaches a tentative deal with the federal government, sending tens of thousands of federal employees back to work. We'll take a look at what's been reached and we'll tell you which workers are still off the job. Also, we will hear from the PSAC President Chris Elward and... My name is Rachel Notley and I am running to be your Premier. This election is a choice between moving forward or going back. The writ in Alberta is dropped. The campaign for the province begins in earnest. This is Primetime Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Serapio. Well, the public sector strike that started 12 days ago is now over with PSAC workers signing a tentative deal with the federal government. As we know from the Treasury Board President Monofortier, the union did make more than 570 demands, with a handful of issues preventing a final deal just days ago. But in the end, this is what the PSAC bargaining team says they have agreed to. It begins with a 12.6% wage increase spread across four years, a one-time lump sum payment of $2,500, which is pensionable, individual assessments of work-from-home requests instead of that blanket decision for all employees, protections against the contracting out of work, and respecting employment seniority should there be any changes in workforce numbers. Now, we should note, negotiations are still ongoing for employees at the Canada Revenue Agency, which means some 35,000 workers are still on strike. For all others, they must still ratify the deal, which has now been reached with federal officials. Joining us now is Chris Aylward, National President for the Public Service Alliance of Canada. Chris, thank you for uh, dropping by tonight. My pleasure, Michael. You know, I want to begin with how you're feeling right now. 12, 12 days after the strike begins, how are you feeling about the deal, about the effort that your team has gone through? First of all, when we called this strike and we had over 100,000 of our members walk picket lines, I, I, every single one of those members should be very, very proud because we can actually demonstrate, here's where we were prior to the strike, and here's, here's where we are now, as you said, you know, 10, 11, 12 days uh, after the strike. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a good deal for the membership. And, and it comes to a point where, you know, it's like, okay, what else do we think might be there? Or, another way of putting that is, what are we keeping our members on strike for now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So when we came to that, you know, decision point last night, we looked at it and we realized, look, you know, we, we've, we've turned over every stone possible. We honestly don't think there's anything else there to, uh, you know, to, to get. Uh, it, it, you know, something like a maybe after two or three or four more days of strike. And uh, the bargaining teams who are, are bargaining teams did an absolutely fantastic job. And they came to the decision last night that we're at the end of the road. We need to get our, our members back to work, and that's why they decided last night to say we have a tentative agreement, uh, and they're, they're all four uh, Treasury Board bargaining teams are recommending acceptance uh, of the deal. So that that's a signal as well that it's a good deal. Okay, a good deal, you say, although when you look at the, of course, wages being one of the sticking points, if you look at the numbers, you were asking for 13.5% over three years. What you're getting here is 12.6% over four. If you divide that up, that's basically a 0.2 percentage point higher than what the federal government was offering. Was it worth going on strike? It, it was, Michael, and, and I'll explain why. Yes, that's the general economic uh, increase that everyone uh, is applied to. Um, but we also achieved allowances for specific groups, such as our, our firefighters. Our firefighters got an additional 4% as a market adjustment. Uh, so, and then the $2,500 that everyone uh, gets, that, that uh, $2,500 is pensionable, it's a lump sum payment. So when we started on day one of the strike, Yes, they had put, when we gave them the deadline of the strike, they put 9% on the table. Mm -hmm. The only move after that was that they, they offered an additional $500 non-pensionable as a lump sum payment. So we had to go back and forth on that. We increased the general economic uh, uh, increases slightly uh, from the day the strike started to, the, to it ended. But with the $2,500 uh, lump sum payment that's pensionable, that's really going to help, especially our low income uh, members. Uh, the members that we've talked about making between forty dollars and $65,000 a year. So that $2,500 pensionable lump sum for somebody making $50,000, that's a 5% increase. 
uh, mm -hmm. for that particular uh, year that we're talking about. So we did well, uh, you know, from day one of the strike to the last day of the strike. Uh, we did well on wages, but there's other issues there as well, such as the remote work issue and seniority for layoffs as well, which were two uh, priority issues uh, for our bargaining teams. Yeah, and as, and as we said in the introduction to you, those are the things you've achieved. But, you know, the, the, there are a number of workers, what, some 32,000 mm -hmm. who are still not on strike right now. We're talking about Canada Revenue Agency workers, uh, and that's because that is separate bargaining that is happening. So where does that sit right now? So they met uh, today, uh, the, uh, both uh, parties met today, and uh, at around 4 o'clock this afternoon, I learned that the uh, employer did make an offer to our, our members at the CRA bargaining team uh, as well. What that offer looks like, I, I don't know. Uh, but, so that's where they are. They're still bargaining, uh, and as you said, 35,000 members of the Canada Revenue Agency are still on strike as we speak. Mm -hmm. But the very fact that the government has now made this offer, does that make you hopeful that that might be resolved soon? Uh, our bargaining team is there, uh, and I, I know they're working extremely hard to, to get this done. Uh, and, and they'll be satisfied once they realize as well that, okay, there's no further to go. Uh, and let's get our members uh, back to work. Okay, so again, uh, so we'll keep watching what's happening with the CRA workers, but the tentative deal now reach, uh, from, from your vantage point, where does it go from here? Because ratification, how quickly will that actually happen? So we will get all of the information, because there's a lot of uh, information contained in the tentative agreement, of course, so we'll get all that information uh, out to our members in the, in the coming days, and we're hoping to, to get this ratified literally in the, in the coming weeks uh, ahead of us. So. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. That the, you know, it's the member's choice now whether to uh, accept or, or reject the uh, the tentative agreement. Now we have spoken every week of this strike, and now the resolution. I'm going to miss you next week. But you know, <laughs> uh, from the get go, you were saying that the, this strike action was more than just about the public servants who were were striking. That you wanted to set a precedent for workers, public and private sector. So, what do you think this deal achieves? for workers right across the country? Well, it's it's certainly the uh, the best deal that, you know, the, for the, the federal uh, uh, unions are, are concerned. And we're, we're hoping that it truly does raise the bar for, for all workers, uh, you know, non-unionized private sector uh, workers, uh, unionized public sector workers. Uh, so we're really hoping that this raises the bar. You know, the, the federal government being the largest employer in the country, you know, has set that bar. And we're hoping that uh, it helps every single worker in this country, because every single worker in the country needs a fair and decent wage increase. So what do you see that as then, like a floor of 3% for negotiations going forward across the country? Well, actually, when you look at it, it's a little bit more than that, right? So, so it's north of, of 3%, which, which is good. Uh, and again, with the other, you know, the $2,500 lump uh, sum payment, the other allowances, we, we've certainly closed the gap uh, on the uh, rate of inflation. And I think that's good. I, it's certainly good for our members. And as I said, I, I sure hope it raises the bar for all workers in this country. Chris Aylward, thank you very much for the time. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you. The federal government says it is working with allies to help remaining Canadians who want to leave Sudan. Over the weekend, Canada ended its evacuation flight effort, saying the situation on the ground had become too dangerous. Meanwhile, the Foreign Affairs Minister, Melanie Jolie, did meet with regional leaders in Kenya, along with Canadian diplomats and evacuees, people who were able to leave Sudan. Meanwhile, here at home, special measures have been put in place for Sudanese nationals currently in Canada. This is going to make sure that people who don't have a safe place to return to are able to uh, maintain their presence in Canada and we're going to be flexible in allowing them to transition between study permits or work permits or visitors visas uh, as may be required so the people who are here can continue to live life uh, with minimal interruptions. To discuss the latest, we are joined once again by Nicholas Coughlin. Mr. Coughlin was the sole Canadian diplomatic presence in Sudan from 2000 to 2003. And he was also Canada's first ambassador to South Sudan from 2012 to 2013. Mr. Coughlin, thank you for joining us once again. Thanks so much for having me. Now, as we noted uh, as we introduced this topic, Canada has now sus uh, suspended flights and that essentially leaves the port of Sudan and escape by sea as the preferred option. But just how dangerous is that journey? If Khartoum is too dangerous for Canadian forces, what will it be like for civilians to travel what I believe is hundreds of kilometers out of the capital to get to the port? 
Well, there's no question it's going to be problematic. This isn't this isn't the magic bullet, no no pun intended. Um, it's uh, you know in normal circumstances, it is a metal road. In normal circumstances, it's a 12 hour drive. Um, I understand people have been taking between 35 and 45 hours uh, to do it over the last few days. Um, I, I would say number one challenge of, of using this route. Um, and this is, you know, obviously it is security on the way. Um, one of the strategies which the UN has used and the US has used it at least once is uh, organization of a convoy. Um, and from what we understand, there have been at least aerial surveillance. They've put aerial surveillance over the convoy to give them advanced intelligence of any problems coming up ahead, um, which is uh, obviously pretty useful information. Uh, a number of challenges, I, obviously the actual travel, also just getting your people together in Khartoum will be hugely problematic. Uh, Khartoum is literally from one block to the next controlled by different fighting parties. Um, so that's still going to be an obstacle, as it was for people getting to the airport before. So that's, let's assume you get to, to Port Sudan in some organized fashion. I think air evacuation is then an option. It is definitely a safer option than it was in Port Sudan. And uh, Sorry, than it was in Sudan, uh, in Khartoum. And your second option is maritime evacuation. Um, there are ferries across to uh, Saudi Arabia, Probably not where most people want to go for one reason or another, but uh, of course we do have a couple of ships in the region, um, as do other uh, other countries. So that is a is a, an option for getting people out. But certainly, it's not necessarily. It, I think it is the only option at this moment. That doesn't mean it's an ideal option by any means. Yeah, absolutely. Now th there were uh, reported six Canadian evacuation flights uh, that did successfully land and get Canadian nationals out of Sudan uh, before the whole operation was halted. Uh, more more than 500 people were flown out, uh, according to reports, but only 175 were Canadian. Uh, aren't Canadians prioritized in those kinds of evacuation flights? Oh, they, they, they certainly are. Um, but, you know, we all, uh, it, these, these evacuations are necessarily a, a team effort. Um, if you have to kind of visualize this, this airstrip, which is an old military airstrip to the north of Khartoum, um, it's actually not in very good condition. Um, it's under fire, as we've seen. Uh, your number one objective is to keep as, as few planes on the ground at any one time and to turn around those planes as quickly as you can. Uh, that requires quite a lot of complex coordination with your allies. A couple of times that nearly went wrong. Nothing, not Canada's fault in any way. But um, uh, the UK, uh, you, you know as well as I, the political situation there, they have been under heavy pressure on their evacuation flights. And there was, there was a, how can I say, a minor diplomatic incident when basically they flew in a plane without having coordinated with the Germans who were doing air traffic control. And there was nearly a, a potentially a, a major incident. So you have to coordinate. And, and the game is that everybody, uh, everybody plays their part. So, uh, for example, in Juba, we didn't send a single plane in. Um, Canadians all went out with our allies. Um, this time, we've got planes in, so we are taking other people out. Um, I believe we took 140 Americans, which, you know, in some ways is, is repayment to that debt. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think the people getting on the planes, are, frankly, that fussed about the flag on the back. The main idea is to get out, and that's all. Uh, that's, it's, a, it's a team, a team project doing that. Now, uh, the foreign minister, Melanie Jolie, she is currently on the ground in Kenya trying to help the situation from a distance. But, you know, realistically, what can the minister do if she and the diplomatic mission are not physically in Sudan? That's a major challenge. Of course, uh, nearly all our allies are still out. The one exception is the United Nations. Um, they uh, they left Khartoum, but they moved their, their core operations to uh, to Port Sudan. Uh, and again, I, I hesitate to, to quarterback on this, uh, but I think where as if Port Sudan remains secure, I think we're going to see a number of countries thinking about putting back in a small presence, uh, both consular to um, uh, to assist with uh, citizens uh, getting out of Port Sudan, whether by sea or by air, and also political and diplomatic and aid related, because there's no question Port Sudan is going to be the principal channel by which, when security permits, that aid is going to flow back in. So Port Sudan is the obvious place to reopen. But I, I say I hesitate to quarterback the decision. Uh, uh, but from what we know at the moment, it is relatively safe there.
Now, the current uh, advice still is for Canadian nationals in Sudan to, to shelter in place. Given all the machinations are happening right now, is it wiser to try to get your way to Port Sudan or to stay where you are? Very difficult decision. I'd really hesitate to call that at, uh, you know, 13,000 kilometers away, and it varies day by day. Uh, but having said that, we've had at least one um, uh, American convoy, American-led convoy, uh, has made it as slowly, uh, but without incident to Port Sudan. The UN convoy made it. Um, and and I, I sense from what I hear that there is talk of more convoys as the situation permits. Obviously, it is better to go in a large group. It is not that, I, and again, it's worth remembering Foreigners are not necessarily targets here. It is a question of crossfire and also of looting and, and, and banditry rather than uh, uh, groups deliberately targeting foreigners. Um, but, but, but no question, it is a risk. Um, and really, I, I couldn't say whether an in, any individual in any given situation to, should take that risk. Uh, but I think it's clear that is now the safer option than uh, restarting um, aerial evacuations from Khartoum. Nicholas Coggan, really appreciate the experience and the expertise. Thank you for this. Thank you so much for following the story. Two of the other stories making headlines on this Monday, starting with new allegations of foreign interference and intimidation involving China and Conservative MP Michael Chong, an issue that sparked this exchange in the Commons today. His government has known that a Canadian MP had his family threatened because that MP voted for human rights in the House of Commons. He knew about that for two years. He did exactly nothing. As the reports were made public this morning, uh, we followed up immediately uh, with top officials uh, to get all the information on this file, on what happened, on who was informed and who was not informed, to make sure uh, that we are following up in an appropriate way. This is absolutely unacceptable, and it shouldn't have happened. Chong says he is profoundly disappointed to learn from the media that a Chinese diplomat based in Canada targeted his family in Hong Kong. The conservative foreign affairs critic believes the Canadian government should have told him and should have expelled the Chinese official involved. The Globe and Mail says Chong was targeted two years ago for condemning China's treatment of ethnic and religious minorities within the People's Republic. This definition, which would apply going forward, would be inserted into the criminal code. It provides the clarity that gun owners and industry leaders need and the protection that advocates have long called for. The public safety minister says new amendments to Bill C-21 include a detailed description of an assault-style firearm and the definition would only apply to guns designed and built after C-21 becomes law. The government would ban semi-automatic firearms that are not handguns, that discharge center fire ammunition, and that were designed with a detachable magazine holding six or more cartridges. There would also be a review of that definition after five years. Other government amendments deal with so-called ghost guns and protecting Indigenous treaty rights. Well, it is now confirmed Alexandre Trudeau will testify about the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation and his role in the acceptance of Chinese donations. The Prime Minister's brother goes before the House Ethics Committee on Wednesday. Last week, Alexandre Trudeau said he wanted to defend the Foundation's reputation. He no longer sits on the board but does remain a Foundation member. The former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton will be in Ottawa this week. She will attend the Liberal Policy Convention at Ottawa's Shaw Centre Friday. Clinton will be on stage for a conversation with the Finance Minister Christopher Freeland. And you'll see it all right here on CPAC. Our convention coverage starts Thursday when the Prime Minister delivers a keynote speech. To Alberta now, as the provincial writ was dropped today, which means Albertans will be heading to the polls on May the 29th. Already, the election is expected to be a heated campaign, with polls saying United Conservatives and New Democrats are in a dead heat, and the city of Calgary the deciding factor in any party victory. At its heart, this election 
is a choice between moving forward or going back, between embracing forward-looking policies to grow the economy, generate new opportunities, make life more affordable, or returning to the costly failed policies of the NDP. For the sake of hundreds of thousands of families across Alberta, we can't afford to go back. And with Albertan support, we won't. Instead, we can move forward building the stronger, more resilient, more prosperous province Albertans deserve today and that we want our children and grandchildren to inherit tomorrow. But I will work every day to protect your health care, to protect your education, your job and your future. And you also know Danielle Smith. And you know that she will tell you what she thinks you want to hear. And then she will go ahead and she will do whatever she wants. Privatize your health care, gamble with your pensions, pander to extremists. Fact is, it is just time for a better government, one that is focused on what matters to you. Well, with more on Alberta's 31st general election, we're now joined by Jen Gerson, freelance journalist and the co-founder of The Line, and Tyler Dawson, the Alberta correspondent for The National Post. Uh, welcome to the both of you. Thank you. Hey, Jen, I'll get you to start us out here. You know, according to the polls, as you know, this is going to be a tight race in what is a historically conservative province. So is this a, vind a vindication for Rachel Notley or, or a criticism of Danielle Smith? Uh, could that be both? Could, could I lock in both answers? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> So I, I, you know, I do think that Alberta does get a reputation for being a conservative province. I think that that conservatism is less rooted in ideology and more rooted in an accident of history. Conservatives have traditionally been associated with protecting this province and um, uh, being in opposition to the liberal governing elites of Ottawa and on, and, and Ontario. Um, so, uh, uh, because the, the the fealty to conservatism is is really more tribal than it is ideological, um, I and I know I know a lot of conservatives are going to get angry at me for saying that, but I think it's generally pretty true. Uh, it, you know, it it may not be that uh, you can rely on this province to vote conservative based on conser the same conservative values that a lot of partisans would necessarily associate with conservatism. Um, yeah, so I, I, the 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 high ratings for Rachel Notley, I think, are very much a reflection of the fact that she uh, is, you know, has governing experience. You know, she was premier for several years. She didn't really have a scandal prone uh, uh, time in in government. Certainly, there are a lot of conservative people who associate uh, the uh, economic fallout as a result of the 2014 oil crash to her, her party, and her party's policies. Um, but I think that when you compare that to uh, Daniel Smith, who um, doesn't really appeal to a lot of more moderate conservatives, a lot of more red Tory conservatives that, that have traditionally made up the PC party in this province, that becomes a much tougher, it becomes a tougher uh, choice than a lot of people would otherwise assume. Mm -hmm. And Tyler, what's what's your read on that? Is this a vindication for Notley? Is this a repudiation of Daniel Smith, or at least a, a wariness that's being expressed right now in the polls? Well, I think a lot of what's going on here is this contingent of voters who are sort of reluctant UCP voters who haven't totally made up their minds and, you know, might have voted for Notley in 2015, but opted to cast their ballot for Jason Kenney's party in 2019. So I think that's sort of the big open question right now is who are those people and, and who are they going to vote for? And the question before sort of these reluctant conservative voters um, is whether or not Danielle Smith's UCP is the same party as Jason Kenney's UCP that they were able to vote for four years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you look at the, the numbers right now, and they seem to suggest that Edmonton and the area, perhaps not surprisingly, will lean more NDP. Uh, also, perhaps not surprising to see that rural ridings are leaning more conservative. But uh, Calgary really is, it seems, the, the linchpin for any victory here for, for, for either the, the conservatives or the NDP. Uh, Tyler, talk to us about Calgary and how that's shaping up right now. Yeah, you know, polls show sort of Notley ahead and then they show Smith ahead. Um, so it's a bit of a toss up at the moment. You know, Calgary has gone to both parties in the past. In 2015, the NDP took most of the seats. The UCP took most of them in 2019. So, you know, I don't think we're seeing some sort of massive realignment here 
um, that explains Calgary being a little bit up in the air. Um, you know, I, I think it's sort of the same issues we just discussed. Is is Smith's UCP appealing to Calgary voters in the way that Kenny's UCP was appealing to Calgary voters? And as Jen sort of alluded to, there's a couple of the things that have happened in the last two elections that just aren't the case this time around. You know, in, in 2015, when the NDP won, that was the end of, you know, 40 years of conservative rule in Alberta. And then in 2019, when Kenny won, that was after four years of sort of economic uh, strife in the province. So it, it's in some ways a very, very different uh, state of affairs going into this election. Mm -hmm. And Jen, how do you see Calgary working out right now? Yeah, I mean, no doubt that it's going to be a battleground. I think it's actually going to even come down to a, a few number of seats in Calgary. Um, some, uh, you know, I'm in the southwest, or sorry, the far southeast quadrant of Calgary, deep, deep suburbs. You know, I'm I'm pretty confident that the UCP will win here. But you know, you start getting into some of the inner suburbs, you start getting into the northeast, you start getting into some of these um, inter more interesting areas. And you know, the demographics are are highly reflective of demographics of other urban areas and other parts of the country. And and as a result, you know, you 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 do have less reflexive conservatism here, just as you would have in any other city in the country. Um, you know, Alberta is really weird in the sense that there's also a significant portion of people who in the 27th to the, in the last couple of years have voted conservative federally and they'll vote NDP provincially. And that's not off. That's not weird. You know, that's there, there's a significant number of people who will do that for, for various interesting reasons. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to come down to a couple of suburban ridings in Calgary that will prove to be the linchpin. I would say that the NDP has the least has a less efficient vote. Um, it, you know, if if we're going into the last days of this election with 50-50, I'd put my money on uh, the UCP over over Notley just because of that lack of voter efficiency. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't say that in the next four to five weeks, if if Notley can can massively increase her um, uh, profile, if she can demonstrate that she's someone who is uh, grounded and takes the economy seriously, and if she can come across as more reliable and less um less uncertain less less unhinged uh, than um Danielle Smith and her her base and her people who support her and, you know I think that a lot of particularly older Calgarians who maybe voted PCs all their life will will give her a second chance okay listen I've got two minutes left here but I want to ask the same question to both of you and Tyler I'll get you to start us off here I'm wondering how Danielle Smith's uh harder stand against Ottawa will factor into this vote will it won't it how do you see that issue playing out I suspect that where that is going to matter is in animating UCP enthusiasts to get out, get involved, help knock on doors, put up signs, that sort of thing. You know, the the hard on Ottawa thing is, I, I think, very much a, a died in the wool UCP member voter sort of phenomenon. Um, I don't think it's swinging that many votes, especially in the places where those votes need to be swung. Uh, Jen. Yeah, if I'm looking at the ads so far, they're focusing on issues like healthcare. They're focusing on issues like taxes. They're focusing on, focusing on issues like uh, character of both Notley and Smith. I'm really not seeing a lot of ads on Ottawa or standing up to Ottawa. I'm not also not seeing a lot of ads uh, associating Notley with Jagmeet Singh or J J Justin Trudeau, which was a, um, something that the Kenny government really relied on back in 2019. So my suspicion is that that's correct, that, that, that Ottawa is not really moving a lot of votes one way or the other. Okay, well, the uh, campaign has just begun. Uh, you, us three will probably get together again before this is over. Uh, Jen Gerson, Tyler Dawson, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you. Thanks. And we will, of course, keep following the Alberta campaign for you right here on Primetime Politics. But for now, that is our program for this Monday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. But do stay with CPAC. Up next, L'Essentiel avec Esther Bejean.